Hi, uh, thank you so much everybody for coming out today and it's great to, uh, great to be here and, and talking with all of you. Um, I want to start with, uh, I'm Michael Morrissey, I'm the co-founder of Muckrock uh, and today we're going to be talking about some of the work uh, we're doing with some really some fantastic partners, including Louise. And, um, yeah, want to talk about sort of the impact that Web3 has had on transparency organizations, journalism, and building a better society. Uh, oh, and I am getting ahead of myself. Um, so uh, today's presentation is talking about from the CIA to the Amazon and, and some examples of sort of the importance of access to primary source materials and how organizations and newsrooms and researchers and activists around the world are really trying to tap into uh, ways to kind of get around the challenges that are facing us. So uh, just a quick survey for, for those in the audience. Um, two questions, I promise. Uh, first of all, who trusts the media? Who feels very strongly about trust in the media? Okay, that's even worse than I thought. Um, uh, who trusts the government? Okay, all right. Um, so uh, my background is in journalism, and, but one of the things that I was really interested in is what could we do to kind of help uh, both newsrooms as well as government uh, do better work and earn back a lot of the trust that they have lost. Uh, and we did that by focusing on something that was a very old technology, uh, the Free Information Act uh, and public records requests around the uh, world. And sort of how do we figure out how do you get access to that primary source materials? Because a lot of times we're told to just trust the government or just trust the media. And one of the things we're really interested in doing is sort of how do you make it so that you don't have to just trust what somebody is saying, but make it easier to actually show evidence? And how do you actually get government and news media to actually involve the public in their work so it is a more collaborative process than it has traditionally been. And so we pulled this sort of old technology right to information requests and tried putting it on the internet, which at the time was a very radical act uh, in sort of taking public records requests and kind of not only helping people file them, but actually show people the process and uh, kind of like a social network for FOIA requests. And we started pitching this idea. People said, this is the most boring thing I could think of. Nobody will find this interesting. Uh, and then we started getting lawsuits and legal threats. And I think three months after we launched, uh, one of the government threatened to throw us in jail. And then people started saying, okay, this is actually pretty interesting uh, as long as you can actually cause trouble with it. <laughs> And so our mission was to kind of build on that and sort of figure out what are ways that we could kind of, rather than focusing on sort of uh, individual stories or kind of uh, individual reporting, build infrastructure for a more transparent tomorrow and build infrastructure that other newsrooms could build on and civil society could build on to help the public better understand their world in some really interesting ways. And so uh, since then, we've had a lot of success. Uh, I, th I thought we had a lot of data compared to a lot of the folks here. I'm, I'm kind of rethinking that now. But we've helped publish over 168 million pages of primary source materials. That's a lot of access to documents that people now have. Um, but beyond all of these numbers, these are also really important documents that had impact. So even though something uh, might be just a few pages, it could have a tremendous sort of meaning to people in a given community or even around the world. Some of the projects that we worked on with partners and with the public were, for example, looking at police militarization and use of force policies and looking at sort of how military gear was kind of creeping into local policing and the impact that that had on sort of the relationship between government and the public. We also looked at corporate and government corruption and using primary source materials to not just sort of say that we think something is shady going on, but show people the evidence. And that was a lot harder for people to refute. Public records and access to information is also critical to really understanding environmental policy. And we've seen increasingly that uh, once data is released, you need to find a way to keep it available and make pe help people understand it for it to have the impact. And then one of my favorite topics is you can even use public data and public records to sort of figure out what are the most popular dog names around the world. Um, and so all this data, all this, this simple tool of Free Information Act and public access to materials can be used in a variety of really powerful and impactful ways that help the public. And that request I showed you earlier, this one request that we helped file, ended up releasing 13 million pages of documents. 
It did take us about three years and a lot of lawsuits against the CIA to actually get those documents out there. But we were really excited because for the first time, the CIA took this vast trove of information and they were forced to put it online. Of course, because it is the CIA, um, they are forced to put it online, but they realize that that doesn't mean they have to keep it online. And so just a few years after we forced them to push this information trove out into the public, uh, all these links started breaking and the data started disappearing. And all these guides and all these resources we had put with the expectation that that they would stay available all of a sudden stopped working. But one thing as we talk to our partners, we realize that, this, that these kinds of challenges, whether that's data simply disappearing and link rot or more serious challenges in terms of internet censorship and civil litigation, we're really starting to outnumber and kind of outgun sort of civil society and newsrooms, uh, not just our organization, but also partners around the world. And this was important, increasingly true of those, those document and data collections that were really societally important. So one of the things we got really interested in is what could we do as sort of a central provider that works with thousands of newsrooms and researchers and activist groups around the globe, what could we do to kind of use that privileged position to kind of help them better combat these threats? A few years ago, we merged with an organization called Document Cloud, and, and this was solving an issue that a lot of our users had in terms of, okay, you've helped us get millions of documents, what's actually in them? And then we started looking at how could we use Document Cloud to start helping build access to the tools that are going to help defend access to information and help make sure that data is, stays available once it's released. And one of the things we started looking at was sort of the potential for Web3 to kind of not just help us uh, get data out there more effectively and more cost, uh, with, uh, with cost savings, but to keep it online in a more resilient fashion. And so over the last seven months, we've been working on kind of revamping and integrating Document Cloud and taking advantage of this amazing community of newsrooms we have and using our tools as a way to kind of give access to advanced AI, uh, new data analysis and extraction techniques, um, all through sort of the familiar document cloud platform that our users are used to, and that already hosts hundreds of millions of, do uh, hundreds of, millions of pages of documents. Um, but then also use Document Cloud as a gateway to help newsrooms kind of transition their data storage and their publication methods to Web3. And so recently we were able to integrate IPFS and Filecoin integration right within Document Cloud. So as soon as a newsroom gets access to documents and can understand what's in them, and if they're now facing censorship attempts or legal threats, or even having trouble with their hosting provider, they can make sure that that document stays available and secure and preserved by pushing it to Filecoin right from within a flow that they're very used to. We've also had the opportunity with recent support to kind of introduce gateway grants, which is our goal of kind of really helping other newsrooms kind of take real world challenges and important document collections and use uh, Filecoin as a way to kind of help address those challenges. Really help them make sure that not only do we, are we able to get access to documents, but make sure that the public has access to those documents for the long term, no matter what kind of threats face access to information going forward. And so today, I'm really excited to have uh, Louise share what they've been working on in terms of their uh, gateway grant, uh, and because I think this is such an important area of access that they've been working on uh, to get access to um, environmental data and corruption data and, and so many other things in one project. So. Yeah, so hi everyone, thanks for your attention. Uh, we are data fixers in Brazil. We are Fiquem Sabendo for those who know Portuguese. Uh, so we are investigating environmental crimes using public data, using FOIA, and now we are using Document Cloud to upload hundreds and hundreds of documents. Sometimes we don't know where to start an investigation. This is a great way to start an investigation, just uploading the documents we got through FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, and then searching for specific keywords. So in this case, we're looking for environmental environmental crime, so I look for timber, I look for the name of a specific organized crime group and things like that. So far we have published more than 50 stories in uh, media outlets such as BBC, Washington Post. We're also helping these organizations to publish their own stories. So they want to publish a story about timber illegal trade between Brazil and the US. We are going to provide data for them and then they will build from that. Uh, we are releasing 
hundreds of uh, uh, documents, uh, but also data sets. So recently we, we've had uh, national elections in Brazil, so we have cross-referenced different data sets uh, to, to say the political candidates who have been sanctioned for environmental crimes in the past. Uh, and we are using Document Cloud to make it easier, so we can share a specific page in a PDF, we can share a specific document, we can highlight things that are important for, for this journalist. Um, so how we are doing that? First, we need to get the data. So we usually send hundreds of uh, FOIA requests every day. We have a team to do that. And sometimes the government tries to deny the data, so we also have a legal team to help us do that. Then we upload the documents in Document Cloud. Uh, and that's the way we start investigation, by uh, looking to those documents. We have a newsletter to spread the documents. So now we have 10,000 readers. And uh, it's not a lot, but at the same time, it's 10,000 journalists, 10, lawyers, 10,000 people who are, uh, this is an active community, so they are always sharing what we are doing. In the same day we release the newsletter, we see five, six, seven stories published in news media in Brazil with the data that we just released. So it's not a big number, but it's also, it, it is impactful. Sometimes we are using data analysis, so we are using Python all the time to get, uh, the, when we get the data from the government, we try to make it a, a, as easy as we can. So even journalists who, do, who don't know how to program, people who don't know anything about programming or spreadsheets at all, uh, we can share with them the, the documents and the, and the data. And we also have many, many partners. So now uh, we are, are starting to publish some things in English, but 99% of our content is in Portuguese. So we have partnerships with radio station, TV stations, the largest TV stations in Brazil, the largest newspapers. We have published many, many stories. And in focusing specifically now on environmental crime, uh, we've been giving people uh, these uh, documents, this uh, data set, so they can find specifically who is responsible for environmental crime. So when we are talking about investigative journalism, the most most important thing is giving names. So who is responsible for that? Everybody knows that deforestation is happening in Brazil, that the Amazon is in danger, etc., etc. But who is doing that? How they are doing that? And the only way to find out is, to, is getting the documents, reading the thousands of pages, and then giving the names, investigating those people. So now we are working on, on a specific story about a guy, a famous guy who is selling violins to Europe and the US violin bowls. And this guy is using illegal timber. He's using Pau Brasil, a, a timber uh, with the risk of extinction in Brazil. Uh, and we found him uh, by just by looking documents in Document Cloud, searching for specific keywords, and th then the magic happens. Uh, and it's also important to say that we are preserving those documents. In Brazil now we have the, the GDPR. So uh, Every, every time the government wants to remove a, a, a document from the internet, they can do that. If it, they, they can give you the information today and tomorrow, they will consider it a secret information. So it's nice that we keep those documents in a separate place in the, in the, in the, in the cloud. So we make sure that in the future, people will have access and we'll name these people who are committing envir environmental crimes. Uh, we are also building a community around those documents and, and stories. So uh, we, we talk to students every year, more than a thousand students, teaching how to use FOIA, how to get documents. We have, we have been working in different projects, not only environment. So this year we have released a lot of documents about torturing dur during the Brazilian dictatorship. Uh, we have a Wikilai, which is like a Wikipedia to learn more about the Brazilian Freedom of Information Act. And we also have a, a community, uh, more than 3,000 stories have been published in Portugal. Portuguese using our data, so uh, we, are, we are trying to make more people aware of their right to know and asking more questions to the government. Uh, so just uh, one more minute to talk about sustainability. This is very important for us. So uh, now half of our money comes from grants, but we are also getting some money, some funds on training projects. We have some private donors. This year we received a $100,000 grant from the Brown Institute for Media Innovation at Columbia University, and we are always looking for help. So if you want to talk to us, just send an email. Thank you. Great. Um, great. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we've been so excited about is like looking at uh, these new and emerging challenges to access to information, but also to preserving it. Because I think one thing that we have seen uh, around the world is increasingly legislation that comes out with good intentions or kind of policies that have good intentions are quickly used by uh, you know corporate interests or organizations that. Uh, take privacy concerns and then use it to be weaponized against journalists, weaponized against the environment, and weaponized against the public's right to know. And so being able to kind of use the decentralized nature of Filecoin and IPFS to make sure that we can keep those documents available for the long term.
So uh, very excited to be here chatting with all of you and also exploring some of these new and emerging ways that uh, the network is used. Um, so going forward, so if you are uh, part of a civic technology group or a journalism group or interested in learning more, we'd love to chat, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you.